So we're going to get started. I got uh, 126 slides, I think, to get through. So um, wanted, uh, I had so many good pictures, I had trouble whittling it down. So I want to make sure I got through them all. Um, so thanks for coming. And I'm also supposed to say that this is being recorded. So any anybody um, who's not okay with that, I, I don't know. Just <laughs> don't say anything. Um, and I'm supposed to repeat the questions as well for the recording. So if I forget to repeat the questions, you all repeat the question, and I'll repeat the question. Um, all right, my name is Chuck Curry. Uh, this is Reducing Tillage at Freedom Food Farm. So just running through basically like the technical aspects um, and our journey of trying to reduce tillage on our farm. Um, over, we, see we started about three years ago wanting to get into no-till, and so we've slowly been transitioning into a no-till um, system. So, um, all right, so a bit about the farm. We're southeastern Mass, Raynham. Um, most people never heard of it. I never heard of it until I moved there. Um, 30 miles south of Boston. We do, this past year, we did vegetable production on about four and a half acres. Um, and we also have five 30 by 96 foot greenhouses. Um, we do grain, we do wheat, rye, triticale. Um, corn and oats, uh, oats with limited success. Uh, livestock, we have cows, pigs, chickens, and sheep. Uh, we do value added as well. We do ferments, pickles, spread, soups, broths, and veggie burgers. We have a Windsor loamy sand. So, you know, they say fine sandy loam is the best um, soil. We have a loamy sand, which is even sandier than that. So, it's really sandy soil. Um, it's a little different than most, or definitely sandier than most soils out there. It uh, doesn't affect us too much. Um, you know, most things carry over to other soil types, but just so you're aware, um, there's also like barely any rocks on it, so some of the things we do um, might be a little difficult on fields that have a lot of rocks. Uh, we do go year-round uh, in our farm store, which is just open two days a week for limited hours. It's mostly just a CSA pickup, 90% of the people who come to the farm store just pick up their CSA. Um, and then we do two winter farmer's markets, one in Somerville, one in Pawtucket, and one summer farmer's market. And that really helps us with the divisional labor over the year. Um, so, you know, in the summer when we're busy growing crops, we only have one market to go to. And then during the winter when it's a little slower and we also want to keep our people employed year-round, we do two farmer's markets. Um, so we're really focused a lot on the winter sales. I'd say about half of our sales are... Um, October to March, and the other half are in the summer. So it's really balanced pretty much throughout the year. Um, which means we don't get a break, but we also get income throughout the year, which is nice. Uh, so we have three to five people who work year-round, depending on the year. Uh, and then during the summer, we have two part-time sales staff um, that do the farm store and some farmer's markets. And then we also have two people who work one or two days a week in the field helping out. Um, but the bulk of it is three to five people just working year-round. Um, they work a few more hours in the summer than in the winter. Uh, and we're currently entering year seven at our current location, which I'm really psyched to be. This is our longest land tenure we've had in uh, 15 years of farming. Um, you know, if anybody saw Biggest Little Farm, he said uh, after seven years, that's really when you see all nature starting to balance out and things coming together. So I'm really excited to finally have made it <laughs> to year seven. Um, so this is going to be the year where everything's perfect. And, um, yeah, so it'll be great. Um, all right, and this is the crew from 2019. Um, we all look pretty happy. We weren't that tired yet. That must have been in June um, and maybe early July. And, yeah, it's a pretty uh, um, excited crowd. I think everyone's really excited to be at the farm and uh, believes in what we're doing, and that goes a long way, and I think it shows in the food as well. Um, so why no-till? I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I'm assuming, has anyone here not drank the Kool-Aid? Um, good. Be, uh, I was going to say, if anyone hasn't, you go see Brian O'Hara because he is mixing up some serious batches of Kool-Aid. Um, I saw him this morning, and he's really, yeah, he could he could sell no-till to a, um, I don't know, to a plow. <laughs> um, all right, so for me, though, it's really uh, to steal a kind of a line from Noam Chomsky. Uh, he said that organized human civilization uh, may not make it past the next couple generations, um, depending on what happens in the next 10 years with climate crisis or climate emergency. Um, so, 
Really, uh, no-till has the ability to not only feed us as we make our way through the climate emergency, but it also has the potential to sequester carbon um, and re you know, reverse the climate uh, emergency. So um, that's, I think, probably the best reason to go no-till, but obviously there's lots of other reasons that are more immediate uh, results. So healthier soils, obviously, um, and healthier soils lead to increased yields. Um, we're definitely getting high, much higher yields off our no-till plots. Um, it also has the potential to decrease labor over time as you get rid of the weeds. The first year or two, uh, you may have the same number uh, amount of labor or even more labor, so be aware of that. But over time, as you stop tilling and get rid of all those weeds and pull them out, uh, you will have reduced um, weeds in the long term, and you'll also have better soil tilth and structure, so you won't have to spend so much time preparing beds, um, ideally. So it definitely does have the potential to lower labor long term, but probably going to raise it in the short term. Um, so also healthier soils uh, can lead, or does lead, to increased nutrition in your crops, uh, increased antioxidants, increased polyphenols, um, increased better taste, uh, flavor, all those things, and that's not just um, anecdotal. We're actually uh, we're part of a conservation innovation grant that NOFA is administrating, doing, uh, and um, NOAA is part of it too. There anyone else in that grant? Carrots and spinach grant. Um, but yeah, we're uh, actually looking at the, all these contents and getting our food tested. And uh, we're just focused on carrots and spinach for now, mostly in no-till situations, but in our Example, since we're doing no-till and tillage, we're going to compare the two of them and see uh, what the differences are. But so far, um, you know, at least we have found out that food grown on a smaller scale has way higher nutritional content and antioxidants compared to what's in the grocery store. Um, and I think no-till, we're going to, at the end of this, we're going to show that no-till is definitely um, has much higher nutrition. So um, keep an eye out for that on the NOFA website. Uh, over time, too, you're also going to have decreased pests disease and weed pressure. Um, obviously the weed, that's kind of simple, you know, because you pull up the, as you pull out all the weeds and you keep them from going to seed and you're stopping tilling up and bringing up old weed seed, um, you're going to have reduced weed pressure and also by keeping the soil covered as much as possible, you're going to reduce weed germination. Uh, but by having those healthier soils and having more uh, microbial activity in your soil instead of beating it up all the time with tillage, you're going to start having less pests and diseases because that plant is going to be healthier. Um, that's really what pests and diseases are. They're here because they're trying to get rid of plants that aren't healthy. That's nature's way of getting rid of unhealthy things. You know, it's like culling the sick deer out of the herd. Um, you know, it's trying to cull the sick plants out of the ecosystem. And um, tillage is creating sick plants, and that's why they're getting attacked by pests and disease. So you will see uh, decreases in that over time. Uh, and, of course, you can put it in your marketing, and there's the cool kids club aspect because everyone's doing no-till, and um, that's what the, the kids are doing nowadays. But I really think um, it's smart. We, we need to be listening uh, to other generations, old people. You know, we always tell young people to listen to old people. Uh, that's definitely true. I think old people also need to spend a lot of time listening to young people. Um, so, yeah, there's, uh, you know, let's, let's listen to what's happening. Um, all right. So strategy number one, I'm going to briefly go through this as well. Uh, so this is what we've always done leading up until we really got into the no-till aspect. I did always realize tillage was destructive and not something that was good for the soil, but I didn't know how else to grow vegetables. Um, I, caught, I got this uh, plan. Basically, this is how John Paul Corten started. He's out at Roxbury Farm. Um, he's since advanced significantly, but when he started in the late 80s, he was doing chisel plow, finishing disc, and perfecto. And he was, you know, his idea was that this was the least um, amount of damage you can do to the soil in order to prepare it for annual vegetable crops. Um, so that's what we went with. Uh, he later on went to an Ironman spader, which is a lot more money. Um, and then he eventually got rid of that because it was too slow. So um, this is what we stuck with. It was pretty cheap. Um, the most expensive part was the flail mower, uh, but I really think that is a pretty... Um, necessary tool for reducing or no tillage on a large scale. You really need a way to chop up those crops really, really well. Um, and I, so I recommend getting a nice flail mower. Um, you kind of don't want to, you know, cheap out on that piece of equipment. 
Um, this is a Rears pack flail. I got it from Owesco, and they um, they refurbish them, so you can get ones that went to you know an orchard might use it for five or ten years, and they buy a new one every five years when it's all beat up, and then Owesco paints it, puts all new blades in, puts in new bearings, and all that, and they sell it for half as price as new with the one year warranty. Um, so we got that for half price and new. It was five thousand um, dollars, but worth every penny. That was uh, definitely one of our best investments after using a $350 flail mower um, for four years. I'm happy to spend the money. Um, and then your implements of soil structure destruction. Uh, this is also, you know, this part's pretty cheap. Chisel plow I got at auction for 1100 I got the finishing disc from a neighbor in Vermont when I was up there for 900 bucks. Uh, the Perfecta, I did end up buying new because those are hard to find used. That was about $4,000. Um, but, you know, not a crazy amount of money to get into on, on larger scale um, tillage agriculture. So basically what we're doing is when we have a, you know, we start with a stand of cover crops usually or sometimes it's pasture. Flail mow as low as we can. Chisel plow. Um, or actually, we, we actually after flail mowing, we usually spread compost first. And then we chisel plow. So we spread the compost first because any compaction caused by spreading that compost, we're trying to get rid of that with a chisel plow afterwards. And then use one or two passes with the light disc. Uh, and then a finishing pass with the Perfecta to get that nice, flat, smooth seed bed. Um, you know, it is still usually four passes or so if you're starting with cover crop um, that hasn't been uh, touched other than the flail mower. So... And it can be pretty hard, you know, driving, this is, you know, we're using 65 horse tractors on this, they weigh 7 to 10,000 pounds, so that's a lot of compaction it's causing. Um, but I still think this is a better setup in destroying your soil less than a um, rototiller. Uh, a bold board plow, I think, also has its place depending on what your system is, what your soil type is. Um, but we just don't use it anymore. Uh, we found we can get pretty good results with this. Um, and it's also a lot faster. The mold or plow can be really tough. Uh, what about the, the Gene Zimmer idea of you just rototill the top inch or two? I think for incorporating cover crops, uh, it's really difficult. Um, if you have a really big stand of cover crop this tall and you only rototill down that far, it's just going to be so much residue at the top that you can't direct seed anything. And um, Maybe if you're transplanting into it, it might be okay. Um, but yeah, and then the other issue too with the road tiller is you're causing a plow pan, right? You know where those things are going around and hitting. So if you only go down three or four inches, you're gonna or two inches, you're gonna have a plow pan or a road tiller pan at that two or three inches, and you're gonna kind of be a little tough for the soil, the plants to get in there. What horsepower tractor are you using? I'm uh, using uh, 65 to 70 horse tractors. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so just quick, this is what it looks like after one chisel plow pass. Uh, and then we come through with the light disc and usually hit it once or twice. I'm just trying to do it as little as possible. So I usually hit the chisel plow, wait a week, disc it, wait a week, disc it again, wait a week, and then perfect it. So in between, you're trying to you know, let the things that are covered up break down. But you know, not everything gets covered up, as you can see, after the first pass. And so you wait for what is covered up to break down. And then disc it one more time, and it covers up more stuff and lets more things break down. If you just go out there and disc it like three times, then you don't really um, let give things a, ch a chance to break down. And so I think that's, um, you know, you're, you're just breaking down the soil structure more by doing that. All right. Uh, and then at the end, it looks like this, which is what we've all been trained for people who do uh, larger scale tillage, um, conventional tillage vegetables. This is like perfect, you know, it's like cake mix. You can stick your hand in there, and it's nice and clean and flat and no weeds. Uh, but in reality, we've killed probably 90 or 95% of our soil microbial life uh, getting it to this point. And then as soon as it rains or we get a big sunshine, we're going to get this crust on top. It's going to be hard. And there's probably a plow pan under there, even though we did chisel plow it. And there's probably compaction everywhere where we drove over with the tractor tires. Um, so it looks great. It's easy to plant into. And it does grow crops, um, but I don't think it's the, the, the best long-term solution for growing annual vegetables. All right, so strategy number two is, um, that we use is uh, using livestock to reduce your tillage. So we use ruminants to try to uh, graze down our cover crop as much as possible, reduce the amount of um, residue, basically, there is. So instead of using a flail mower, 
we just graze the cows or the sheep or in combination, and it takes these huge masses of cover crop and turns them into fertility patties that are super well incorporated. Um, you know, they spread them out nicely over the field. And I, I think also there's something to be said about um, once, uh, I don't know if anybody follows biodynamics, um, uh, Steiner really believed that there was a process that happened um, involving the cow when they, you know, when they ate um, forage and then it passed through the cow, something's happening to that material. It's not just the same material, but in brown form. Um, a transformation has happened that we don't necessarily have the methods to uh, measure yet, um, but it makes for better fertility, and it, it's something that the soil needs is that um, manure. So um, that's why we use that. And then we also have used a combination of hogs and chickens to perform like initial tillage and, and starting down with the tillage and breaking up um, breaking up the soil a little bit. So I'll run through a couple of, uh, we got a bunch of slides of the, a process of doing these two things. So make sure I'm not forgetting anything before I move on here. Right, I think we're good. All right, so here we go. This is a cover crop of oats and peas in late May, um, and we have turned the cows onto it, and I, you'd be amazed what 15 cows can do in a night. Um, and after, so, yeah, it wasn't just that goat, it was most of the cows. Um, you know, we, a section this big would last us maybe a day and a half. Um, we break, it was, let's see, so we have our, sec these sections are two-thirds of an acre, we had three of them, so that's about two acres, and it got us about five days um, with the cows. Uh, and I think we had the sheep in there as well at that point. So, you know, two acres, four or five days with uh, 10 to 15 cows. And it looks like this, totally mowed it right down, broke everything down. Um, beware to, yeah, this is on the pointer, I don't know. Um, up here, you can see there is, uh, there'll be areas where the cows congregate, either around the waterer, or maybe um, if it's a really hot day, they just pick an area and they just kind of like all huddle together trying to like um, find the shade within each other. So you can, can, compaction can be an issue. So that's why we broke this two acres up into five sections or, or maybe even six. And we're moving them every about 18 hours into the new section. Because if you leave it in the one, same section for a couple of days, um, you're going to get a lot of compaction around the water or around a certain area that they like. Um, so you really have to be making sure you're moving those animals through quickly, or if you have cows, um, if you have sheep, they're a lot better about that. They don't cause nearly as much compaction. They have smaller hooves. They weigh a lot less. Um, but you just you don't get like the, the quick eat down like that with the sheep. The sheep will go around and just kind of like nibble on all the things, and when you're left over, there's just all the stalks, which is the hard, like, you know the carbon rich stalks, which is the hardest things to incorporate anyway. Um, so Unless you have a really short crop, uh, the sheep, I think the cows do a better job with the tall crops, and uh, sheep do a better job with shorter crops. So. Um, all right, and then, see, so chickens also do a really good job as well um, of both uh, mowing down crops and tilling. So this is March 4th in one of our greenhouses. Uh, we were done harvesting there. We moved, I think we had 100 chickens in there. So this is March 4th. March 5th, it looks like that. Uh, that's one day later. And three days later, it looks like that. You couldn't even tell that we had crops in there. Um, same thing, too, though. You do have to watch out for compaction with the chickens. Uh, the manure is pretty hot, too, so be careful of having um, too much chickens in one area at a time. You want to maybe give some time for that um, manure to break down or make sure you have a lot of carbon in there to offset the high nitrogen in their manure. Um, but they do a great job of clearing out a uh, greenhouse. You know, thinking about trying to pull this all up by hand in a no-till method, that's a lot of work um, where I'd rather just stick the chickens in there and they do it for me and they pay me instead of me paying them. Um, so that works out really well. And then here's something that's been working out pretty well for us as well. Um, so this is April 24th. The crop's just starting to grow. It's pretty short, so we had our sheep out um, on this pasture. Uh, this was mostly clover. We had grown grain in there, I think, um, two, either a year before or two years before, and then we frosted clover, and then it was, and, um, 
and some forage species, so it had been just a pasture for two years, and we were looking to um, turn one of the sections into winter squash. So April 24th is when we turned the sheep on, had them graze it down as, long, as low as we could. We left them on there like a little bit longer than I normally would when moving, rotationally moving the sheep because we wanted to really get as much of that uh, forage down as possible. And, turn, you know, the sheep manure is really super for, uh, high in fertility. Um, I think it's best to get as, you know, biodiversity is the key to it all. So the more types of manure you can have in your farm system, the better, I think. Um, well, types of animal manure, not uh, sources. What um, clover do you frost in red clover? Uh, we do red clover, yeah, because uh, we have the yeah. super sandy soil, and um, white clover doesn't go so well for us. And the mammoth, uh, just from the Lakeview, the seed dealer, they say that the red clover has more persistence um, and is better for grazing systems, and the mammoth is better for cover crop systems um, because it doesn't regrow as quickly, um, so that's why we use the red clover. So uh, it's a longer term, takes the punishment of the animals. Yeah, it just yeah it regrows better after grazing. Um, yeah. All right, uh, so after we grazed it down as much as we could with the sheep, uh, five days later we put the pigs in, and again we took this. So we took a two thirds of an acre area, and we broke it up. I think I would put it into eight sections for the pigs, and we're moving them every two days um, onto a new section. But, you know, I've experimented with the pigs for a long time. I used to, you know, have the whole two-thirds of an acre, and I'd just put the pigs on it um, and hope they'd till it up. And they'd till up, like, a third of it, and then the, a third of it was their bathroom area, so they didn't till that up. And then the other third was just, you know, play area, and they didn't till that up either. So you get tillage in one area but not the other area. So, you know, you've really got to find the balance with the number of pigs you have and the space and the timing. Um, I think, you know, a day is best, but really, who wants to be out there moving your pigs every day? Um, two days was what I could swing in April, so we kind of just found an area that um, eight pigs could tear up in two days, and then move them on. They just do such a good job of tearing up the whole area if it's limited space of what they have. How many pigs is this This is eight pigs. Um, and yeah, it's two-thirds of an acre broken up into, I want to say, eight sections. So, like a tenth of an acre for two days for eight pigs. So they're like not that. just eating, they're actually rototilling with their nose. Yeah, yeah, so they'll eat the clover down, and then once they finish eating it, then they start tilling it up and eating all the roots. Um, so May 6th, you can see, yeah, they're doing a really nice number on it. They're tilling the heck out of it. Um, you know, there is still some live clover here and there, especially because they pick one area as their bathroom, and that um, area doesn't get tilled up as much as the rest. Um, but it does a pretty darn good job of tilling it up. Um, and then again, though, you have to be really beware of compaction with uh, having them in, in one area too much. Keep an eye out for the weather. You know, if you're getting a lot of rain, um, you're going to want to move them faster because they can really mess it up. Um, think about your soil type, too. If you have clay or silt soils, um, you've got to move them probably even quicker uh, because compaction can be an issue. But like I said, we have that loamy sand soil, so um, you know, we, it, it'll take a little bit more abuse. So this is what it looks like after they've moved through. You know, it looks almost just like the chisel plow. Um, it looks pretty good. Uh, it's maybe not buried things as deep, um, but hopefully, you know, we haven't driven over it with a tractor, so hopefully we haven't caused so much compaction that we need to get in there with a chisel plow. Um, this is a ground rod. I went out there. This is my penetrometer. I have a ground rod in the back of the truck, and I just see how far I can stick it in by hand. Um, and I stuck it in that far by hand. I probably could have kept going, but I want to make sure you could see part of the ground rod for the picture. Um, this is the length of the ground rod. It was a three foot, just so I could prove how, <laughs> how far it went in. Um, but yeah, it seemed, you know, it was really nice, not much compaction at all. Um, and then we followed that with the chickens, and the idea was the chickens would come in, and um, yeah, all this, the clover that was still sticking up and had some leaves and whatnot, the chickens love that clover, so the idea was they come in and eat off the rest of that. Um, kind of, you know, also I like to ha follow them with the pigs because it kind of scratches the manure out a little bit, gets rid of any parasites that may, might be in the pig manure, um, add a little more fertility. It, you know, it's debatable. I feel like the, the chickens do cause a little more compaction, and then to move those coops, we did have to end up driving around um, the tractor on there. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say this is... Uh, 
the best way to follow the chickens after the pigs. It does work, um, but yeah, you're creating a little bit more compaction, but you're getting more fertility, so um, you know, it just all depends on the situation and if you have chickens or not and how much time you have to move them in April. Um, so this is actually a different year, <clears throat> but I wanted to show this anyway. This is when we're using pigs to turn in a cover crop um, and also to feed pigs. So we had a triticale Austrian pea cover crop, and we let it go all the way to seed, and then we broke up a two-thirds of an acre section into, I think I did five sections, four or five, um, and we moved the pigs. We just did once a week in each section, but there was mature triticale and Austrian winter peas in there that the pigs were eating. Um, we only fed them about 20% of grain ration during that time, so you know, times uh, four weeks and two-thirds, that saved us a lot of grain. Um, and then when they were done, you know, this was cover crop that, you know, it died down, but it was still this tall of just really carbon-rich cover crop. Um, and after moving the pigs through, it looked like this, you know, it was almost bare ground. And then all these little mounds, uh, those are worm castings and worm holes. So there was just incredible amount of worm activity after we moved those, um, those pigs through because they had worked in a lot of that carboniferous uh, matter and the, the worms just loved it. And I guess probably because we didn't till it and kill all the worms, um, getting the, the um, cover crop mixed in, they were right there and ready to start doing their thing. And, um, you know, that's a lot of fertility there. And then also what the pigs didn't eat started germinating. Um, so we got a cover crop after that, uh, um, afterwards. And I, I think we just... We have a no-till drill, and so we just kind of like hit some patches that didn't, you know, like where they were by the feeder or by the water or by their shelter. Um, there, you know, we didn't get cover crop growing up, so we just hit that area with the no-till drill to get better coverage. But you know, 80% of it reseeded itself, and we didn't have to um, see the cover crop again. So uh, this was, you know, that that was a year where we weren't getting any cash crop off that area. It was just a cover crop the whole season, um, but we didn't drive the tractor over except to do those little patches with a no-till drill, so that worked out pretty well. Um, all right, so back to that uh, area where we're trying to prepare for winter squash, and we had the pigs moving through. Um, you know, I pro if I had done just pigs, I probably could have got away with out chisel plowing. Um, even with the chickens, I, I debated it. I was like, well, do I want chisel plow or do I not? Maybe I can just hit it with that light disc and then play it. Um, but winter squash is a really is a cash crop for us. We need it. If we don't have it, um, we're not eating for the winter. So uh, I went ahead and I did chisel plow just to be on the safe side. Um, there were some areas like I think back towards the back they didn't do the best job. I think um, yeah I forget what happened there. Maybe I had to like move them because of the weather, or maybe I had to plant. I think yeah maybe it was getting late and we we're about ready to plant the winter squash. And I was like we just got to get them off of there and, and chisel it. Um, so we did chisel it, uh, but I think I just did one pass with the light disc after that, and then we planted. So we skipped a uh, pass with the light disc and a pass with the Perfecta by having the pigs go through. Um, so it did save, you know, it's 50% of our tillage right there, 50% of the tractors driving over, 50% less compaction. Um, so that worked out pretty well. Um, oh, let's see if I can get this to work. Um, supposed to be the last cultivation in the winter squash um, by the light of the tractor at 9.30 at night. <laughs> um, the obligatory, oh, look how hard I work. Clip. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> I believe it. I do work hard. Um, all right. So, July 24th, it had a pretty good crop of winter, squ winter squash. Um, and so the only fertility we, so, yeah, on the note of fertility, too, the only fertility we added to this was 30 pounds of nitrogen through um, soybean meal and 20 pounds of potassium from sulpo mag. Um, and that's it. Everything else came from the cover crop, um, the sheep that were on it before, and the pigs and the chickens. Um, and winter squash is a pretty heavy feeder. Um, and we still, you know, we had very minimal disease. We had nice green leaves all the way up until um, mid-August or so, uh, late August. Or 
Direct uh, transplanted, yeah, yeah, transplanted uh, with the water wheel. So yeah, it worked out and very barely had to put any fertility on there. Is it plastic or is this bare ground? Uh, bare ground, yeah, just do bare ground. And then this is uh, yesterday. I went out there and took the final picture because uh, I, I didn't have a shot of me putting in the um, cover crop. But after we harvested that winter squash, I could have gone in and just no-till drilled and not had to um, till it again. Because you know, typically we're tilling in the spring and then we till again in the fall after the crop is um, is harvested, so that we can get our cover crop in. Uh, the no-till drill, which I'll talk about later, really. You're cutting your tillage almost in half right there by eliminating the tillage on the on the other end of the season. So I did go in there, and since we're planting uh, grain to harvest, um, I was worried about weeds, and um, you know there was some clover and stuff in there that uh, had kind of survived through cultivation and whatnot. And I just want to make sure we had a nice clean bed for um, the wheat that we planted. So I did go and do one pass with a light disc. We didn't chisel, rechisel it or anything. We just did flail mode light. Uh, pass with a light disc and then no-till drilled in um, some Frederick wheat uh, that we will hopefully harvest next uh, July. And that's what it looked like a couple days ago. It came up pretty well, I think. Um, all right. Chuck, did you, the uh, soy meal and the uh, soap bag that you put on, did you just spread it on the surface? You didn't incorporate it in any way? Or? I did, yeah. So I spread it uh, before the last this this game. So yeah, just before the last tillage of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Now we're into this. All right. So I got to speed up a little bit. Okay. So hand power no till in the market garden and the greenhouses. So you know there are definitely people who have been working on this longer than me. I pretty much just ripped them off um, and gone to all the other uh, um, talks that Brian O'Hara does and Jen Salinetti and. Um, uh, it was a guy from Frith Farm. Um, Daniel Mays. Yes, Daniel Mays. Um, and then Doug at Gaining Ground has mostly just been following Daniel Mays, but he's a lot closer, so you can go over there and check out what he's doing. Um, there's, yeah, uh, JM Fortier. Um, yeah, there's a lot of people out there who have been doing this no-till market garden stuff longer than I have. Um, so I just went out there and gleaned as much information as I could from them and uh, tried to make it work at our farm, and it worked. Um, I have to say, when I first started going to those talks, um, I was like, this can't work, that's so much labor, like, how is this ever going to work? You know, because a lot of the farms are non-profit farms, and I, I wasn't really convinced that it could work, um, the economics could work on a non-profit farm, um, which, yeah, like a no-profit farm. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and lo and behold, it worked just as well or better than what we've been doing before. So, what we did for, um, this is our, we kind of did some experiments last year, or the you know, 2018 on a smaller scale, but 2019 we jumped into it um, and we transitioned three quarters of an acre into what we call the market garden. We picked out uh, the, the crops that are high value and quick succession to do in there, so carrots, beets, basil, cilantro, radish, hakurai, all your greens, spinach, head lettuce, salad mix, arugula, chard, etc., and then we also, for a few years, we've been doing pretty much those same hand-powered techniques in all our greenhouses. Um, but once in a while, we'd be in there with the rototiller. But then, so 2018, we're like, no more with the rototiller. We're done. We parked it. Haven't touched it since. Um, and uh, doing those same methods for the high-value crops in the greenhouse. So we did purchase uh, a, you know, a few new pieces of equipment in addition to, you know, we already had the regular repertoire of um, equipment you see on a 10 to 15 acre vegetable farm and we tried to utilize some of those pieces as well um, but we also bought some new pieces of equipment so I'll run through all that um, so existing stuff we use so we set up all our market beds you know most people are doing 30 inch beds and like four feet on center or something like that um, for us we wanted to be able to use some of our equipment so we did six feet on center um, but we have two foot aisles so one thing with us is that we have, you know, we have 90 acres, so we have a lot of space. Our space constraints aren't as tight as a lot of the smaller market garden people, so we wanted to use that to our advantage. So we did the six foot on center, but it's a four foot bed top, and we have two feet of aisle space. So it is a little tough reaching over to the other side or whatever and get in the middle of that bed, but we have two feet of aisle space, whereas a lot of the other farms are squeezing into one foot, so it's kind of a trade-off. Um, 
but the big thing is we can drive our tractors down um, if we need to, and you know we, we're planning on doing that for the first year or two until we got uh, the weeds under control and the fertility up where we didn't need to anymore. So we have a Alls Chalmers G with a diesel engine, which I can't say enough about. You got to go diesel with those things, um, and. We have a basket weeder on it, so we're using the basket weeder for cultivating a lot of the crops. Um, the chard, the beets, and the head lettuce, um, I think just those three, but those were on uh, the same spacing as we had in the field, and so we were able to just go in there and basket weed them for weed control. Uh, and we also found the basket weeder was great for bed prep. Um, you know, where they do have, we thought about buying a pow power harrow, but it was a little out of what we wanted to spend for budget-wise especially since we have to buy the BCS to go with it. Um, so we just ended up using that basket weeder, and it does a pretty nice job of just, you know, it's like a tilter, basically, and just goes through and cleans up the uh, bed and incorporates things and fluffs it up a little bit if you need to direct seed things. So that was great. You know, we just go offset a little bit one way and then turn around, offset the other way a little bit so we cover the spot um, that normally where the crop would be. Um, so we get, you know, till the whole bed just a little bit, you know, a couple inches deep. So that worked out pretty well. We have a finger weeder for the basket, uh, for the G as well, and that was really nice to be able to go in there and finger weed the crops, save some hoeing, hand weeding. Uh, we have a water wheel transplanter on the same spacing. So again, everything that we're weeding and doing on three, uh, three rows per bed, we we're transplanting with water wheel, like the, um, the beets, the chard, and the head lettuce. So that saved a lot of hand time out there planting and also saved moving irrigation by watering it in as we plant. Um, we do have a flail mower, and the idea was to be able to go through and flail mow um, as we needed to, but we actually didn't end up doing it. Um, two reasons. One, uh, that flail mower is pretty heavy, and then that would cause a lot of compaction, um, and the tractor we usually use it on isn't set up to six feet right now. Uh, but we found it really, um, the, the, cost, the benefit to the cost didn't really work out. I think like the, cost, the amount of compaction we would cause by using that flail mower didn't seem to be worth um, the amount of labor it would save. Where it really wasn't that bad to go in there and just rip out like you know, if there's like 50 or 60 heads of lettuce left that we didn't harvest for whatever reason, you know, just pull them out, chuck them in the compost pile, and you know, go on with the bed prep. So we didn't use it that much. But if I had one on a BCS, I think that would uh, we would have used it a lot more. And then the idea too was that we could use a compost spreader, or we're thinking about getting a smaller one so we could drive right down those beds, spread compost. Um, we didn't end up using it because really, again, the cost to, to um, price wasn't really worth it as far as the amount of compaction of driving. You know, we just only have a really big compost spreader now. Didn't want to cause all that compaction, um, so we just did it by hand. And but before we, I'll show you. But beforehand, we used the compost spreader big time. So, you're worried about compaction. If you have a bed six foot on center, all your equipment is set up. You're only driving on the two foot that you're planting. Right, yeah, there's definitely that aspect, um, but if you look at, um, yeah, I remember some of my soil textbooks from college, they would have pictures of the, the root systems underground when you had compaction, and the, the compaction doesn't go just down, it radiates outwards as well. Um, so, you know, you're just driving over that, and there's a wheel track there, but if you look at the compaction under the ground, it forms like a bell like this. It's like a, a plume, where, like same as you see a water plume, like going out like that. So, you know, as it, you push soil down there, that soil's pushing out there, too. So, um, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't have been nearly as bad yet because we had those permanent beds, but uh, it was still um, an issue. And also, our compost spreader was wider than six feet, so we'd kind of be, like, running right on the edges of the beds, and um, it's a big compost spreader. So, all right. Um, so, yeah, I'll run through a little bit how we uh, prepared beforehand, but some of the new tools that we went out and purchased is really... You know, after buying, like, this equipment um, for uh, larger-scale vegetable farms, uh, going out and buying some of the market garden equipment is, like, way easier on the pocketbook. It's like, oh, like, $241 for a broad fork. Like, that's way better than, like, $5,000 for a flail mower. Um, so, you know, they're definitely, some of these are worth their weight in gold. Um, this, the one on the left is the one we bought. It's from Johnny's. It was $241. Uh, our rating, yeah, it depends on what time of the day, how your back feels, how much, how good you feel about that um, that tool. But it is a really essential tool. This is in order to of uh, you know most useful to um, not as most useful. Uh, the one on the right is called a I want to say it's a prairie 
creature, yeah, prairie creature, um, that our greenhouse manager bought or is borrowing, and that's um, the other one sits on the shelf now because she likes that one better on the right. So uh, I don't know, looks a lot better built. Um, and I think it's cheaper as well. Uh, tarps, that's super essential if you're going to go to no-till. Um, go to Brookdale, that's the cheapest price by far, $165 for a 32 by 100 foot. Um, I've seen them anywhere up to two or two hundred fifty dollars. Or I feel like Johnny's are charging like three hundred for them. Um, so you know, always look around. Check Brookdale; they have the best prices. Trevor's super knowledgeable. Uh, rating ten out of ten. It's you know, it's a whole. It's it's life changing to figure out the tarps and start using the tarps um, for weed control. Uh, caveat: a little bigger is not always better. We did start off with some forty footers or fifty footers, and it takes a lot of people to move those around. They get a lot of water on them. Um, Thirty-two by hundred. I feel like that's the biggest you want to go. We feel like we could even use a few that were like only like uh, you know twelve or eighteen feet wide, so we can just put like put them down for better too and move them around a lot easier. Uh, Jang cedar. Uh, I've heard you know I kept hearing how great they were. And then I got one, and they are super great. Um, nobody lied to me. Uh, they're pretty expensive, um, twelve ninety for. We got a five row setup, um, but it's like phenomenal. It was just like life changing thing right there to be able to see the whole bed in three passes. Um, yeah, it just I, especially if you're doing a lot of winter greens, this is like pays for itself in one season. Um, compared, you know, we're out there transplanting like, you know, 10 trays of 288s of salad mix in a greenhouse, and then now we just go out there and just freaking seed the whole bed in like 30 minutes and with one person. So that was revolutionary. Um, again, 10 out of 10 rating. So initially, though, we bought a six row because uh, this wasn't, or I didn't really realize you could put five gangs in a three row. When I bought this, they only had three and six rows, and I was like, I want the six. And so we got the six row, we actually, we also got a grant for some of this stuff. So um, it was pretty wide. And it was really unwieldy. And then we ended up putting all six gangs, like, together because, you know, you could space them out on the six-row frame. Uh, but they all ended up being, like, on one side. So there was, like, almost half of the frame that was empty. And it was just really difficult and hard to maneuver because you had this frame that was that wide, but you're only seating something that wide on it because um, we weren't using the, the wider row spacing or between row spacing. So they, Johnny's does now sell this directly like that, a five gang on a three row uh, frame. Um, we found that that's like the best setup for a market garden style. Um, all right, another thing, uh, irrigation, having a small, easily movable irrigation system, uh, super important, you know, because as you move from larger acreage to a smaller acreage, uh, you really have to concentrate more energy and make sure you know, you're doing all you can for that crop so you can get those yields that you want on the smaller spacing. Um, so irrigation is key. You know, in the field, you can say, oh, you know, it didn't rain so well, so we'll just grow two acres instead of an acre in case we don't get enough rain and, you know, you don't irrigate or whatever. Um, but on a market garden, you know, you, you hand prep that bed. You better make sure you're going to get every, all the yield you can out of it. Um, so these are Netafim Meganet sprinklers. I'm sure there's other companies out there, but this is what Trevor sold us, and he likes them. We like them. Um, it's five, it was about $500 for all the valves and the mega net, like, you know, there's like a special tubing it needs that goes into um, that covered 30-foot wide area, seven sprinklers, covers 100-foot long spacing. Um, we did end up spending more money and just putting it, pretty much setting up so like the whole area was set up with the, um, the tubing, and then we just had to move the sprinklers um, it cost, you know, it probably doubled the amount of cost, but it was like a third the amount of time. Um, and labor is just something that we really um, have been shorter and shorter on and um, less and, and less wanting to pay uh, minimum wage for um, entry-level people. Just uh, does, it's been tough economically. So. to a lay-flat type system? Yeah, it's pretty much, uh, they sell, it's their own lay-flat type tubing with um, just every like three feet or every six feet, depending on what you get. There's like a little um like a port that you can screw in either a valve that goes into this or a plug so you can like plug it every three feet and then have a sprinkler every six or whatever you want to do um so yeah what we end up doing is just having that lay flat and valves go throughout the whole you know every six beds there was like a, a roll of tubing and a lay flat and then so you can just turn that valve off move the you know those sprinklers are quick disconnect you just pop them right out and uh, bring them over to the other area set them up 
plug them in and then turn that valve on and you got water over there. How wide are the covered six beds for us, so it's about 30 feet. Um, yeah. Driver sells an on-off meter with it, so we can do 400 feet. We can turn half of them on, half of it off, and so we can control. Oh, like halfway down it? Yeah, we can have, we can have on and off nozzles in each one. It's sweet. Very right on. I'll have to look into that. Really valuable. Yeah, because I, so I gave it an 8 out of 10 because we had water pressure issues. Um, we're on town water. We don't have a well, so water pressure can get pretty bad. Uh, originally, we were only able to run three or four at a time, and that was, like, really difficult because you had to, like, then you had to, like, move the plugs and everything, and that was a lot of work. Uh, we ended up just running. We went, like, straight into the, you know, it was water going through, like, five greenhouses and then out there. Um, so we just ran a one-inch line straight from the barn. Where, like, the water comes into the barn first and then goes everywhere else. Um, so that alleviated it, and we were able to do seven or 100 feet at a time. Um, Glazer wheel hoe, $382 from Johnny's. I looked around, and you can't find them cheaper. It's one of the one things you can't find cheaper than what Johnny sells it for. Um, I, w- I gave it an 8 out of 10 only because it was $400. Um, it's like an awesome tool. I should have bought one long ago, almost essential for a market garden. Um, you know, it is a chunk of change for what it is, but um, from what I hear, they last really long, and we've been happy with it. I think we probably saved that much already um, in the first year. It gets a lot of use, so I'm uh, pretty happy with that. Do you have um, alternative implements for it, or just the standard stirrup? Just the standard stirrup. Um, yeah, I haven't looked into too much into anything else. Cause we, you know, I've looked at, like, the TerraTech has the weird fingers and everything, but we have we have a finger weeder on the G, um, so, yeah, I don't know. I didn't want to spend too much money. Um, and then we also got this push uh, flame weeder that was pretty nice. Uh, it's a lesser-known one. It's called the Calvin Cultivator from Ford Farm Tech. It's $939, which, again, is kind of pricey for what it is. Um, and it actually came a little bit, bent, like, banged up, and, like, the thing was bent, and some of the welds were, like, broken, and... So I uh, called them up and complained, and they knocked $100 off it, um, which was, uh, I took it and fixed the welds. And, um, and, but it's been great. It's pretty nice. Um, you know, you do up and down a bed, does both sides of a bed, and you don't have to have the compaction of, like, a tractor-mounted one. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty easy to use. You put the tank right on there, especially, too, if you drag tanks around with, like, the little hand thing one, it's like, no more of that. I'm done with that. Um, yeah, this thing is awesome. All right. Oh, one more. Yeah, the tide rake. This thing was didn't work so well. Um, I think it was like 80 bucks. But from speaking with other farmers, uh, apparently you got to get the one with like the the curl on the top and more of a um, some more. Is the one that's like 300 dollars. So I didn't want to jump in and buy that. So we tried this out. Turns out uh, there's a reason the other one's 300 dollars and why people pay 300 dollars for the other one. So I think that's on the list for next year is to get a better tide meter. Uh, all right, so initial site preparation. So, you know, knowing that this was our last chance to drive a tractor over it and a manure spreader, or hopefully, or a compost spreader, um, we spread lots of compost. Uh, we basically went in there, chisel plowed, um, you know, spread tons of compost, or the, and then chisel plowed, and then perfected, got it, like, really nice like we normally did our fields, and then we tarped it for as long as we could, trying to get rid of the weeds, also keep some of that moisture in there. Um, here's spreading, you know, I, I put like, I don't know, eight, I want to say like 80 yards of compost on uh, two thirds of an acre, just kept filling that thing up and blasting it all over the place. Cause you know, every pass with that saves us, you know, whatever, like a hundred trips with a bucket by hand. So figure we put down as much as we can. We also with that loamy sand soil, um, and it's low organic matter as well as dairy farm for a long time. So, um, a lot of the fields were kind of farmed out low organic matter, um, low water retention, um, so, you know, just as much wa- compost as we can get. We also, we get really cheap compost, um, not inexpensive, it's cheap compost. Um, so there's no weeds and stuff in it, but it's not, there's not much microbial activity in it. There's a lot of sticks and stuff. Um, it's made from municipal yard waste, um, and they, uh, so, but they sell it basically. We're just paying the trucking fee because they have to get rid of it. So it's like eighteen Casella bucks. Or... Yeah, from Casella, it's uh, twenty bucks a yard delivered. Um, can't beat the price. We, you know, it's basically just organic matter. Um, so we're also trying to get away from that because who knows what's in there? Um, you know, I have looked at the compost analysis. Nothing too crazy according to their analysis, but um, I'm sure over time, 
you know, it's not good to keep putting people's leaves and, uh, and um, lawn clippings on there. All right, uh, and then after spraying that, we chisel plot it, try to break up any compaction from driving over a bunch of times, and then hopefully that was the last time we're going to be driving a big tractor over there. Um, from there on, it's just driving the, the G. And actually, no, we did drive the transplanting tractor over a few times. We were doing the, the char and the beets and the head lettuce, but that was a lot lighter than our tillage tractor. Um, and then, yeah, preparing the uh, greenhouses the same way when I'm building the greenhouse. Last thing before we do the end wall is we spread tons of compost and then chisel plow it and then perfect it. Um, the reason I don't do it before uh, building the structure is because you end up walking all over it and you're like, you know, driving stuff in there, driving the truck in there because you need to reach up and get to the bows or whatever. So I feel like at this point, we have, you know, we're almost done walking in it and then you can put up the end walls without having to walk around on there. And you start off with a nice, you know, Nice area, low compaction, a lot of compost in there. Because um, then from then on, we only have human-sized doors. We don't have tractor doors in our greenhouses. So from then on, it's just, uh, you know, buckets and and, um, and uh, wheelbarrows. So want to get as much compost in there as possible. Uh, bed prep in the market garden greenhouse. Um, easiest, fastest method is to mow and then tarp. Um, like I said, we weren't using the flail mower, but if we did have a BCS-powered one, that would be easy. Just mow it down, tarp it, and then just wait. Um, but that's something if you have a lot of time that works out and more space. But if you're trying to like pack in a lot of crops into an area, then a lot of times, you know, as soon as you finish harvesting head lettuce, you want to get whatever head lettuce is left out of there and get your next crop seed like the next day. So a lot of times, um, if you don't have as much time um, or you don't have as much space, but you have time, then you want to pull out that stuff. Um, and then you could prep it and seed right into it. But really, if you have the space, I'd say just mow it, tarp it, come back in like a couple weeks, and then pull it off, and you're almost ready to plant. Um, it also depends, you know, may or may not need to broad fork. Depends on um, what the crop was, how much you walked in the bed, um, what your soil structure is, all that sort of thing. Uh, you, At the very least, you usually do need to just kind of stir the top of the soil up a little bit if you're going to be direct seeding. Um, if you're going to be transplanting into there, you, a lot of times you just transplant right into it. But if you're going to, we, most of our stuff was direct seeding in there, um, and so we would have to do a little bit of raking. Or uh, if you have a power harrow, it seems like those work really well. Or we'd use the basket weeder, kind of till it up a little bit. Um, or you know, if you have a nice tine weeder, you can just go through there and tine weed it. Um, do you have a tractor tine weeder, or is that little thing? You yeah, just that little thing. Or we've been thinking about getting one. Um, I used to have one for a G. Uh, that went under um, belly mounted, yeah, lily. So um, I think that might be a, a nice investment. Or, yeah, debating between that and the uh, power harrow. Um, so, and initially, too, we had thought about putting, you know, we have a Williams on the back of the tractor with the tines on it. Um, but, you know, we didn't want, it didn't seem like it was worth it to be causing that compaction um, when we could just run up and down with a rake or whatever. It didn't take too long. Um, all right, so after you prep the beds, though, I highly recommend watering them. Um, so water them pretty well, and then either come back in five days and flame weed or tarp them for, like, you know, seven, ten days. The longer, the better. But that's going to kill that flush of weeds. You know, because when you rake, you are disturbing the soil a little bit. You are bringing up some more weed seeds. You are, you know, exposing light to weed seeds that hadn't been exposed to light before. Um, so you're going to have some more weeds coming up. So you tarp it or flame weed it. Get rid of that first flush of weeds and then do your direct seeding or your transplanting or whatever. Um, and then, yeah, the other method is just going in there. And this is, we did end up doing this a lot of times, just going in there, pulling out all the, you know, we had bolted head lettuce or whatever that tall, and you cut it all out, pull it up, or, you know, if it's going to be something direct seed, we pull the whole plant up with the roots, throw in the compost pile or feed with the pigs. The pigs loved it, or the goats. Goats loved it. Um, and, you know, I really, I, you know, it was like, at first when I was thinking about this, like, oh, man, you're out there, like, pulling up crops out that you like didn't harvest like that's like crazy but it really wasn't that bad and um, I think it helped our compost pile having all that nice green um, nitrogen rich material in there so uh, it's not as bad as you think especially you know just when you're getting like 50 or 100 percent more yields per bed space than out in the field it, it adds up um, all right so running through crop uh, rotation of the greenhouse uh, we are doing summer squash zucchini cukes in this greenhouse we had weed mat. Um, we did, I, I think we got the biggest one we could get. That's four foot wide. Um, so we have six foot beds and four foot wide weed mat. So there's just like a little two foot strip where the crop and the drip tape was. Um, or maybe we had the drip tape out a little bit more. 
but we really try to keep those weeds out as much as possible. Uh, that's really essential, too, with the no-till is the thing is, you're going to have to pull those weeds out eventually. No matter, you know, if it's no till, you're going to have to come back when you pull the crops out. You're going to have to pull the weeds out too. So you might as well just get them out as immediately. Because the worst thing is like harvesting around a weed or like watching it set seed, and then you pull it out like after it set seed, like after you've dealt with it, like in the middle of your harvest area for like you know a month or whatever. Just get rid of the weeds like as soon as possible, um, and it's going to make everything a lot easier. So after we Pull, we pulled that crop out, pulled up the uh, weed mat, and then we put down um, tarp. This is white. We put the white side up because it was you know, really hot during the summer and it was in the greenhouse. We're trying to cool the soil temperatures down a little bit because we're about ready to see fall um, uh, greens. And so we left that on. I think yeah, we watered first. Yeah, August, and, September? Yeah, this is, I know, I forgot to put the dates on it. So this one is probably... Early July. Um, this one is August, so we left it on for most of August, I think, um, as long as long as we could. Uh, it's also another reason to have a 32 by 100 foot tarp fits perfect in the greenhouse, um, or if you have that size greenhouse. Uh, and then after we pulled it off, this is what the beds look like. You know, it's killed whatever little you know, uh, broken down any existing um, winter squash and like the roots. We didn't pull the roots up really. We just pulled the the plants, and it broke down almost everything. Um, you know, you could still see the, the beds and where the, um, the, la- the aisles were a little bit. Um, and it was pretty nice. I mean, we maybe could have just raked this and um, put in the, uh, the jang cedar, but I think we ended up broad forking it just, um, whatever, just to be on the safe side, I guess. We're still kind of like a little nervous about going 100% no-till. Um, but, you know, the broad fork, I think we went through. But also, it really doesn't take that long, and it's good exercise. Um, and then, so we seeded with the jang, some spinach into there. We actually, we did get kind of poor germination, or not poor germination, they germed really well, but then we had some uh, damping off in the spinach. Um, I think it was a combination of too much water um, and also putting, we put a layer of compost over the top right before seeding, and I think that just held... Um, we weren't used to that. We're used to our really sandy soil and just like watering the hell out of everything because it just goes right up. But that uh, having that layer of compost at the top, I think, held a little bit of at more moisture than we're used to, and we had a little more damping off um, than we wanted in that spinach. But um, you know, that's what it looked like. So, all right, another uh, rotation here in the greenhouse. Um, this is going to be tomatoes. So we have chickens again in here. Um, and I put tons and tons of leaves. We had so many leaves last fall. Um, I really just went crazy with it because I felt like we never had enough leaves in the greenhouse with the chickens, and it would always end up just like being like a manure mess at the end. So I'm like, we're going to put tons of leaves in there. It ended up being a little more than I think I had to, um, but the results were good. So we left them in there for a good, I want to say the chickens were in there about two months uh, with all those leaves. Uh, after we did, you know, rake the leaves out to the side so they weren't, like, in a big pile in the middle. The chickens also helped us out a little bit, but, you know, we had to go in there and and do it ourselves. Um, And so this is early March um, where we have, you know, it's kind of spread out. A lot of the chicken manure has started to break down um, the, uh, break down the leaves a little bit. This is straw that we had a chicken nest box in there, so when we clean them out, we just take the straw and just throw it on the ground. Um, and let that break down too. So that's where the straw is from. Uh, it was broke down pretty good. We got our tomato plants about ready to plant, um, just hanging out there on the side while we made the beds. Uh, this is late March. I think it was like 10 days after transplant. Um, they're looking pretty happy. We did, so what we did is we, we I realized that there was like, since there was so many leaves, we just kind of like raked out a little trench, filled the little trench with compost, and then um, right around, we made a little spot like this big potting soil in each spot where the uh, tomato plants would go in. So we just stuck those tomato plants right in that area. So you know, kind of trying to reduce the shock so that they, you know, the, the trench kind of gave them an a, like a, an avenue to get down the soil underneath all that uh, those leaves. Because worried if we put it right into the leaves, it was going to be too high in carbon. Um, they had like you know a couple, two or three. Uh, day lag more than I'd like, um, probably because of that, the leaves, but for the most part, you know, they got through that couple day lag and they really just went crazy. Uh, we also side dress them every week, so that helps um, with 
use compost, um, soybean meal, and sulfo mag um, every week, just mixed together, throw them on top of the uh, drip tape. Um, and then, so this is what we got later on in the summer. Uh, we started getting a lot of mushrooms and a lot of fungal activity happening in the leaves and the compost. Um, you know, I've seen them here or there, but it was like all the way up and down the bed. It was looking really, really good. Um, and I think that's a super good sign. Um, is that heated? This is a heated greenhouse, yeah. Yeah, we see we put the tomatoes in early March because we're trying to um, harvest tomatoes for end of May. We, uh, we started our first market in the middle of May, so... We try, we're trying to get tomatoes for, like, the first or second market. Um, so this is uh, slime mold or uh, dog vomit is also the other, <laughs> right, is the other uh, name for it, um, which is it's actually not a fungus. The, when I was in college, it was a fungus, and then I um, looked it up again, and apparently it's no longer a fungus. It is a, a group of eukaryotic single-celled organisms that have the ability to form a larger structure together. Um, so... Learn something new every day. I gotta go back to college. I think and learn this stuff over. That's um, a nickname, or that's what it's, people call it, dog. Uh, dog vomit. Yeah, is what so that's the nickname. No, no, that's like an actual. You can Google that dog vomit uh, fungi or whatever. Um, I gotta go yell at my old uh, mycology professor and tell him he gave you the wrong information ten years ago. Um, and you can see why it looks more like dog vomit as it uh, starts to sporulate um, there, as it breaks down a little bit more. But, um, you know, our greenhouse manager, like, sent us a picture of that. He's like, oh, my God, like, what's happening in the greenhouse? And I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, that's slime mold. That's good. Um, or at least I hope it is. There's actually even a little bit on the base of the, um, the stem there. Yeah, you can see right there. Um, that really looks like dog vomit. And it was like, you know, like a dog came in and puked on the bottom of our... Uh, tomato plant, but um, it made some killer tomatoes, so I, this is not a bad thing, I think. Um, I think it's a good thing. All right, so we had some really nice, the cucumbers loved it too, best greenhouse cucumber um, season I've ever had. Um, you know, I've always been trying to figure out the fertility on cucumbers. I always saw pictures with, like, cucumber leaves that big. I was like, how the hell will they do that? Um, so apparently it's dog vomit. Um, and, you know, we were picking, we, we pl- we planned on changing that bed into tomatoes in July, and uh, we at that because normally by that time the greenhouse tomatoes have, or the cucumbers have petered out. Um, we started picking end of April, and so I figured by early July they'd be done with. But um, so you know we had these tomatoes ready to plant, and the cucumbers were still producing like crazy, and we like shed a tear as we like ripped them out, even though you know it was the best cucumbers we've ever seen. Um, so yeah, Grace is excited about them as well. Uh, and this is, so, you know, this has gone all the way up. We, this is uh, 10, you know, at least 8 feet in the air, the um, purlin, uh, yeah, the uh, cross ties. And it's just loaded with cucumbers. And normally, you know, you, you try to prune more of these fruits, but they're so high up, we're like, we well, can't prune that anymore. You walk around with stilts like Mike Collins. And, uh, and they just, they were producing like crazy. And we just, yeah, all the way up. And then they started coming down and still producing like crazy. Um, so yeah, I, I really think that this mostly, I think that biological activity that happened with the, uh, all that, those leaves in there, um, and all that, uh, compost and, you know, the add nest fertility in there with the chickens. Um, again, this is now, this is early October. Um, there's tomatoes are still going strong. We've been picking them since late May. Um, we just do one succession, uh, you can see, you know, there's like no disease on here. We don't spray either. We spray, we don't spray anything at the farm um, except occasionally compost tea, but we don't use any, um, you know, organic or non-organic or whatever. We just don't believe in it. Um, so, you know, we're still getting awesome foliage, no powdery mildew, no early blight. We're getting a little curl here, maybe potassium, maybe magnesium deficiency, but, um, you know, we pull those leaves off and the new ones grow and, no problem. Just kept going, kept lowering them, kept lowering them all. You know, just tripping over vines. Are you still side dressing, or are you just? Yeah, yeah, side dressing every week with uh, the compost, um, soybean meal, and supple bag. Um, sometimes we mix in like. Um, you go right over the next to the drip irrigation, or you go right over the dead vines. And... Uh, yeah, just every just every spot where there's like a drip spot every eight inches, we're just going with a bucket and just throwing a little thing yeah. right on each thing, right on uh, each drip spot all the way down. Yeah. Um, Growing tomatoes outside as well, or just in the house? We're doing it just inside now because we. This is more. We grew. We couldn't sell as many tomatoes as we had in this one greenhouse, so we 
you know, yeah, no more outside, just do them inside. Um, the flavor isn't as good as the outside ones, but, um, the, you know, people are used to the, the, the grocery store, so these are like, you know, 100 times better than that. Um, we won't tell them how good the field ones are, hopefully they'll forget. And just, um, so, and this is late October, they're still cranking, loaded with tomatoes, um, again, we, you know, we plan to put winter greens in there. We're like, oh, man, we're going to pull these tomatoes out. They're still producing. Um, but we wanted to get the winter greens in there, and our market was ending. So, you know, if we wanted to keep heating it, we probably could have pe- kept picking them all the way into November, um, which is a pretty long, long harvest window. Um, I haven't totaled up the tallies, but we got, we got some serious um, yield off of that. So heat in the spring? Yeah, this is heated uh, propane. So, yeah, just in the spring, though, we don't heat at the end of the season. Um, that's the other, you know, the night started getting into, like, the 40s in the greenhouse, and, you know, the flavor just isn't there, too. Once the sun, you don't get as much sun in the fall, the flavor goes away. Um, so, and this is where you get award-winning tomatoes. We won the uh, Massachusetts Tomato Contest that year with our cherry tomatoes grown in the greenhouse. Uh, it's Lane and Grace, our greenhouse team, um, super excited with the cherry tomatoes and their trophies. That's the first time we entered, and I was really happy that we won. Actually, it was funny because I was like, oh, you're excited we won? I was like, no, I knew we'd win. Like, of course we're going to win. Look at those things. Um, I knew they were the best tasting tomatoes. Um, so it's like Sun Tzu, only, only do it if you know you win, win ahead of time or whatever. Um, so more bed prep. This is how we're prepping in the um, market garden with the um, broad fork and go down and make the beds. Try to get through here fast. Uh, this is, you know, the results of the jang. You're getting nice, you know, sweet, even lines. Um, and then water it right in. Um, not many weeds because we had this tarped beforehand. Um, some more glamour shots here of the market garden. That's the other good thing about the market garden. It's just like so aesthetically pleasing to me to like look at that. And so like, you know, it's out in the field. There's like weeds everywhere. I'm like freaking out. Like, oh, I got to get out there with a the cultivator. And um, it's just, it's like really nice like to have that mix out there. And um, hopefully the neighbors appreciate it. Although I think the tarps probably like counteract because all winter it's like covered in tarps. So it probably looks like trash, but. Um, so this is, I want to say this is early May, and here's my Williams cultivator that, like, kind of gives me agita just because, um, it's always, like, that, yeah, it just, it just has such a correlation with me on, like, hot August days out there trying to cultivate a million things and, like, moving the, all the equipment around and the knives around to fit, you know, four different crops in a day, and, like, still there's weeds coming everywhere, and, um, it was just, like, very, zen to like not have to deal with that until like you know we, obviously when we're doing like winter squash we got it out of the weeds and started using it but um to not have to touch that until early may that was like a win for me personally um and uh this was me instead of uh using the williams i was just sitting here sleeping in the sun um no i actually did this maybe once the whole season but i'm starting to understand the older i get uh this is a measure of a good, successful season. How many naps did you take in the sun? Um, that is maybe better than your budget sheet or your, your balance sheet at the end of the year or any of those things. Um, how many times did you fall asleep with a smile on your face All right. um, during the day? Okay. Uh, so more, this is like, you know, what we're looking for, really nice soil structure. Uh, it's kind of faded, but this is a lot of this is... Um, uh, hopefully mycorrhizae, but definitely some sort of mycelium. Uh, maybe it's just breaking this down, but a lot of fungal activity, a lot of soil structure. Things are like holding together and like, you know, aggregates, nice aggregates, um, more aggregates. Uh, I know it looks like it got snowed on, but really that's just, um, you know, different microbial beings, one of the three billion per sp- spoonful or whatever. Um, more nice shots. Uh, we had really good success doing the carrots with the jang. Um, High density seeding, we're getting about 500 pounds out of a 100 foot bed. Um, also, or 400 bunches, we're doing $4 a bunch, so that's like $1,500 out of a 100 foot bed. Um, it's, you know, the economics are, are there for sure. So there's 15 lines because you're doing three rows of yep. five? Yeah, we do three rows of five in the field and we do four rows of five in the greenhouse. Um, so, yeah, so we're getting 400 bunches or 500 pounds out of a 100 foot bed. How many yeah. seeds per linear foot in each of those rows? Uh, I don't know. Um, it's pelleted or raw? It's uh, pell- pelleted. Um, yeah, we're using pelleted. Probably like, it's a I would say like every inch. Is it a six wheel or a 12? I, 
I'll be honest, I'll make an admission here, I've never touched that, I've never used that Jang. Um, our greenhouse manager and our market garden manager have been doing, I don't even know. It's, it's 12, that's like, even beyond L.A. Coleman. <laughs> yeah, it's something, I don't know, I, I, I should have got all the numbers, all right, I have all the numbers somewhere, but I haven't looked through it, but I think it's like an inch or an inch and a half. Impressive. Um, yeah, it, it's really worked really nice with carrots. Um, we did a lot of hand weeding in there, but I think in the years coming, we won't have I'm nearly as much hand weeding. carrots, you're able to, uh, you're not... Um, honestly, it the tilt in there is so good. We're, we're, at first, we're using the broad. I like went out there with a the broad fork. Like when I finally like helped start help harvest in the fall, and they're like, "What do you what do you need that for?" I was like, "You just pull them out." And I was like, "Oh, okay." And so yeah, we just go out there, just pull them out, and they just pull right out. Um, all right, and then so this is uh, we're doing like a fall succession of carrots. We tried taking off uh, Brian O'Hara's idea of. Um, we didn't just broadcast, we did use the Jang, but we were trying to look for a little bit more soil coverage and a little bit better germination. Um, so we spread, we did one, uh, one bale of straw mulch over a 100 foot bed, um, and that seemed to have pretty good results. Um, they came up, they looked better, uh, they had less weeds, um, that seemed to be something worth doing. Um, years later on, we had a pretty nice stand. Uh, we're still harvesting those carrots. Also, those carrots taste way better than the ones we grew out in the field um, during normal tillage operations. They're like, they, yeah, they taste way better. They're really good. The Elliot Coleman candy carrots, I get it now. Um, we use arugula in the same situation, really healthy, came up nice, thick stand. Um, although we had some super warm weather early September, and all, you know, 80% of it bolted. But that's the way it goes, arugula. Um, greens, I just couldn't believe it was like the best stand of greens I'd see. I'm like, oh my god, and like, want this like freezing time, and then a week later they're all too big to harvest, but that's the way it goes. Um, all right, so hand powered no till economics. Uh, we did two thirds of an acre. Uh, we're pretty sure about the labor because we kind of divided this year. We just had like one person and a part time person working in the market garden, and so it was 40 hours. They worked the same amount every week. 48 hours did the per week from April to October, did that whole two thirds of an acre. Um, we double cropped about half of it, so it ended up being an acre of crops so on two thirds of an acre. Uh, we're paying them about 18 an hour, so $26,000. That's not so bad. Um, spent about 2,000 on compost, 2,000 on seeds. Call it 5,000 for equipment depreciation and buying new stuff and whatever. Um, and it was about $80,000 worth of veggies we sold out of there. Um, we, like I said, we could have produ- we could have sold way more. Like those greens, a lot of those greens just bolted because we didn't have. You know, we grew more, we got better yields than we were expecting, and so we couldn't sell it all. And also, you know, the, the, with the climate emergency, you don't know when you're going to get a, you know, bunch of 90 degree days in early September and all your stuff bolts. So, um, you know, if we were better about having smaller successions more often, we could have got a little, a lot more than that. Um, but again, just to remind people who haven't run their own farm yet, uh, that's not $80,000 in your pocket because, um, or 80 minus 26, you still have... All your marketing, you got to sell it. You have your overhead. You have your land cost, all that. Um, so don't forget about that when you see the other numbers. But still, um, that's as good or better than um, out in the field. So, um, yeah. All right. Uh, considerations. Mulching is always great. Um, so in order of preference, uh, I think green chop, which is just chopped up green um, clover grass, is the best thing to mulch with. Um, that is probably also the hardest to obtain. Um, I'll go cover that in a little bit. Uh, we do mechanized no-till. I'm going to get cranking, though. Straw, uh, plastic fabric is probably the um, lowest preference, but it's also the easiest to use. So, yeah, reverse it if you're looking for ease of use. You know, plastic is the easiest, whatever. Uh, occultation versus solarization. Um, solarization, you're using clear plastic tarps. Um, I feel like it's not as good for the soil because you're really burning it, but it's a lot faster, so it's just like a faster way um, to kill all your crops, um, or, yeah, kill, you know, to get ready for planting for the next one. Um, occultation is the black and white tarps that you're just keeping light from coming off, um, getting in there so the weeds don't germinate or they germinate and die. Um, more, definitely more labor per acreage. It's about one to two full-time equivalents per acre for a first year, but um, still wasn't as high as I thought it was going to be. Um, Concentrate on your high-value crops or your high-density crops and then your greenhouse crops um, at first because, you know, focus that labor that you do have on those high-value crops. Um, all right, so mechanized no-till. So the acre grant, uh, agricultural climate resiliency and excellence, maybe? Anybody from MDAR want to 
correct me. Uh, I think that's what it is. They just opened it up a couple years ago. We applied once and got it, but I guess from what I understand, it's getting more and more uh, competitive. That's through MDAR. Um, but they will pay for 75% of no-till equipment, um, uh, up to $25,000. Uh, we used it to get a cover crop roller and a no-till uh, grain drill. Um, they also kill over no-till planters. Somebody used it to get... Um, uh, baling equipment for their BCS, like a round baler and like a mower and stuff for their BCS so they could do mulching. Um, you know, whatever, if you can convince them in there, you can convince them and, you know, get whatever you need, I, I think. Um, but just write up a really nice uh, report cause, uh, or, or application because they are getting pretty tough, I think. Um, and then there's transferred mulch system, which uh, Jan Hendrik Krop, I have that in the references, um, He's a guy in Germany who's working on that, and is basically doing green chop, where he's taking a flail chopper, like you'd see on a dairy farm. It's basically a flail mower, but it shoots all the chopped up stuff into a bin for you, or a forge wagon. Yeah, so, uh, Jan Hendrik Krop. Um, uh, oh yeah, I'll get you a handout. But he's on there, and his website's on there. But it's in German, so you got to learn German or translate it. Um, and so... Yeah, it chops up a little uh, clover grass, and you use that. Um, some of the best things about that is he was measuring, he's getting 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre from that green chop. So, he, like, he's basically that's providing all the fertility for that crop that it needs by just putting that green crop on there. And he was showing pictures of where the fungi came up and just started eating away that green chop. It was just, like, putting nitrogen, like, straight into the plants. It's like phenomenal system. Um, that's what we're going to do for our next acre grant is going to, or hopefully if they approve us, get a flail chopper and or a forage wagon. Um, and then, you know, thinking about no-till transplanter or no-till cultivator maybe. Um, and then, yeah, rotary spader would be great, but I think the amount of money they cost um, might, you know, there's other places I'd like to apply for grant. And the power harrow does seem like it has a, um, a place somewhere, but like I said, we still don't have the BCS. All right. Hopefully this one's going to work. I don't know. Um, well, sorry about that. But this is a, uh, was supposed to be a video of our roller crimper, um, roller crimping things. Oh, sorry. Um, all right. But anyway, uh, roller crimper. We rolled uh, this cover crop here. Um, it was uh, triticale and Austrian peas and rye. Um, it did roll pretty nice. It terminated everything except for the Austrian winter peas. Um, so I decided not to plant our winter squash into it because, for one, we didn't have as much coverage. Um, you know, you can still see some bare ground spots, and I feel, felt like we're going to have a weed issue. And also, the peas just like grew right back up, and like three days later, they're like this tall again. So. Um, we're going to try again next year, but without Austrian winter peas. Uh, this is the section next to it where it was just, um, you know, we actually did conventional tillage. We're going to do a side-by-side, but ended up just doing winter squash and weeds side-by-side. Um, all right, so considerations. Yeah, legumes can be hard to terminate with a roller crimper, uh, but I went to the NEVGB, uh F conference uh, the other day, and John Paul said, run them over. Was your no-till drill after roller crimping, and that will kill the legumes? I used. I just went back. I had the same thing happen. Mix a dry and Austrian winter peas, and they stood back up, and I just hit them again one more time, and they didn't come back. Right on. All right. Yeah. Maybe I just need more. Trying to come back, and then I finished them off. Yeah. So I just need to be more persistent. (laughs) Um, All right. So yeah, maybe I'll try that next time. Uh, Also, seed early and at a high rate. Uh, you know, late August, ideally, early September at the latest. We were doing 200 pounds an acre. I think, you know, you got to really get up there. Um, and then we are mixing different crops. I think, we're too, sometimes we have too many crops in there, and the maturity times are just too different. So you got to narrow it down to one or two crops that have similar maturity dates. Um, so you're roller crimping at the right time. So this is uh, from Penn State Extension. Um, this is, you know, different times when they roll the crop and the amount of kill they got. So the, the line is the percentage of kill they got. Um, and then it's, you know, the days that they were rolling. Um, so, yeah, really good. timing is crucial is basically what this says. Um, so the triticale and the rye went down, stayed down. Yeah, yeah, and they terminated, and that was great. But, yeah, the Austrian winter peas just came right back up. Um, but, yeah, maybe I should have just come back and rolled it again. Um, Do you roll with the, with the 
Was it behind you or in front of you? Behind, yeah. We don't have any front three-point hitches, so... Because I heard that's one of the problems, because where your wheels are, they're pre flattened so the crumper doesn't crimp where the wheels are is good. I was worried... That? I, I figured out how to... I just used a come-along to... Um, I welded on two pieces of channel, lock, channel iron on the front of the three-point hitch of my roller crimper, yeah. so I could get the lip of my bucket on there, and I just put a come along where the top link goes, and it stayed on. So you were really and so I was able to put down pressure on it that way. Yeah. 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 That uh, you water. can't steer, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's great. yeah, I thought about yeah putting it on the bucket on the loader of the tractor yeah. too instead, like ha- setting it up. So that's the way to jump all You can adjust the down pressure, and you don't need to mess around with lots of weights on the back. Gotcha. Do we have another question? All right. So, yeah. So, front mounted. You've got to keep looking for those front mounted ones. Um, all right. So, I was trying to run through a cover crop rotation um, with the no-till drill. So, we started uh, the year before with Bob Roska's. Poor, had a poor, we overseen clover in there, but it had a poor stand. So, we no-till drilled in oats and peas in the spring, and then we grazed them, and then planted sorghum, sudan, sun hemp, and then we grazed the sorghum, sudan, sun hemp twice. Uh, and then we no-till drilled in the fall cover crop mix. So this is going through a whole year um, of cover crops without having to till at all. So we started, um, this is the place where, this is the no-till drill, Great Plains. Uh, we got, it's a three-piece 606, so it goes on your three-point hitch. We have a lot of spaces where we're turning around and stuff, so we wanted that instead of the trailer-mounted one. Um, and also we want a six feet, so that's like our bed. It fits down each bed. And, you know, if we harvest one bed, we can just go down, like, plant cover crop in that one bed. Um, worked out pretty well for us, but they make all different size models. Um, that's about also maybe the biggest I'd want to get on that this is a 65 horse tractor. Um, so drilled in this, same picture from before, we're grazing the cows on it, oats and peas. Um, and then again, this is what it looked like uh, after they graze. And then we went in and we no-till drilled in Sorghum Sudan. Um, I mowed one section and didn't mow another section to see if there was any difference between it. I didn't really see any difference, so it seems like it was a waste of time to go out there and flail mow it. Um, all right, and then you're seeing some of it coming up. And what's really nice about this is, like, look, you know, you're getting, you're not losing that soil um, coverage. You still have all this, um, you know, like stems and stuff from your oats and peas that are there covering the soil, breaking down, getting microbial activity. But you have your cover crop coming up um, in between it, which is great. Uh, Came up pretty nice. Uh, this is July 19th. This is also July 19th, different part of the field. So you can really see it did kind of come up weird. Um, you know, depending on, I think this is like compaction where the cat, we had the cows there like an extra 12 hours or whatever. And there's more compaction there than in the back of the field where we moved them on time. Um, could also then, you know, we got more cow urine there and we had more available nitrogen. Um, this is also, this is seven days later, but seeded the same day. And this is a part that was, had been conventionally tilled and had a lot of, we had pigs there for a while, so there's a lot of fertility. So just to show you, you know, it, that is what it could have been, but it was only that big. So, um, you know, whether that's fertility, compaction, who knows. Um, fertilizer, just ambient? Yeah, no fertilizer, just whatever was there. This is, you know, we did have pigs kind of there for a little while, so it had a fair bit of manure. That's also a winter housing for the sheep, so they're like, you know, there's a lot of sheep manure there. Um, all right, and then we grazed the cows on the sorghum sedan, uh, grazed them you know, pretty good on there. And then, so we grazed them twice because a lot of people like, you know, they say, well, for one, you, get, you might as well get two uh, forages out of it. Um, but people say you cut, you know, normally you, they say to mow the sorghum sedan at two-thirds of the height so it shoots out the roots again and really breaks up compaction. And so this is after the second, um, or no, this is after the first time I went out there to really see what was what. Was what. And uh, you can see these root goes all the way down there. And you can tell that was like a new root. It was super white, really strong. And really, you know, look at that one. It was really, you know, that, I just pulled that up. So who knows how long that went if I dug down into it. But it really went down there and, and I think broke up some serious compaction. So that was nice. Um, and we didn't have to drive the uh, flail mower over it. So after we uh, pastured the animals on there twice, um, they, they, they grazed it down pretty far the second time. Then we no-till drilled in our fall cover crop mix, which is wheat, triticale, um, rye, uh, forage radish, and uh, I can't really remember if we put clover in there. Um, but, yeah, and it came out pretty nice. Um, and, yeah, again, we didn't have a till for the whole year. 
So another thing, we did one field um, side by side. We tilled again in the fall, and the other one we didn't till again in the fall. I just kind of wanted to see what the differences were. And also this one, we're going to try to roller crit next year. So um, I wanted to make sure we had got rid of all the weeds because there were some weeds in here. Um, it seems kind of silly. We're like tilling so we can not till next year. Um, but, you know, I'm still playing around trying to figure out what works. But side by side, this, you know, this was two days ago. Um, this is a lot greener and it had better coverage than the one that we did not till. So this was tilled in the fall before planting that fall cover crop mix. This was not tilled. Um, so I think it, you know, it is kind of compaction probably. The, you know, that whole season of just, you know, thing, animals stepping on it and driving over it with the tractor. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it takes time for your, your soils to like convert to no-till and, and get enough tilth where um, the compaction isn't an issue and there is enough biological activity that you don't have these discrepancies between tilth and no-till. Animals were on the left. Animals were as they're both treated the same. It was that they both had that same treatment I ran through, but then in the fall, before playing that fall cover crop mix, one of them I tilled and one of them I didn't. So I think the one on the right, okay. since it got tilled, it got like, you know, rejuvenated with like more air in there and more, you know, got, you know, you get that short term benefit, but it's, you know, probably not like a long term thing because I'm like eating up, you know, the, the stuff. All right, so the trials and stuff under the development. I get really late here. I was hoping to um, cover a little bit. Uh, have time for more questions, but hopefully people can stay a little late. Um, so just things we're trying. Uh, we just no-till drill some buckwheat in here to see if it could like grow faster than the weeds, and it kind of did, kind of didn't. I don't know if it worked so great. Um, this is where we harvested uh, garlic from these two beds, and then I said, hey, we got this really nice place with a lot of compost under it and leaves over it, and no weeds. Uh, let's plant some brassicas in there uh, without tilling it. We did that with a water wheel. It came out really nice. Um, this section we just no-till drilled in sorghum sedan and sun had, but it came out even better. Um, but also, you know, maybe some of the reasons this didn't come out the best is because it had six-foot-tall sorghum sedan grass on one side and corn on the other. Um, but it did work. Uh, it wasn't as good as the tilled stuff on the field. Uh, we've also tried seeding our vegetables in the no-till drill. Um, like we did our spring peas, we just put them in the no-till drill and just seeded them right into, we had a no-till area from the year before. It worked out great. Um, didn't have to till it at all. Uh, you have to worry about the spacing between rows, think about compaction. Um, if you do get a no-till drill, make sure you get the small seed box on it because that's going to be essential if you want to try to seed your storage radishes and turnips. Um, you can also get a no-till vegetable seeder from Monosum. Um, All right, uh, transfer mulch system. So Jan Hendrik Krop, um, he's the guy. This is his website. Um, he's supposedly got a book coming out. Hopefully it's going to be translated to English. Uh, and, but he's got this transferred mulch system that that's really works pretty well. Using a flail chopper to harvest clover grass mix and you're applying it onto uh, either before planting or after planting. Um, John Paul Corten says they have this specially developed planter um, that, and it's available, but he says it's expensive. When John Paul Corten says a piece of equipment is expensive, <laughs> it, it's got to be really expensive. Um, so I don't know. I, I haven't looked at the price yet. Um, but like he said, he's, he's getting 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre from that green chop. Um, also, the thing with that, too, is uh, voice and principles for grass growth. If anybody's familiar with that, it's basically you harvest grass at the right time, and it um, encourages the grass to regrow and form a lot of roots, and then the roots that were under there died off after you top, you, know, you, you cut it down. The roots that were supporting that large amount of grass die off, become carbon in the soil, and then it does this regrowth of really fast growth, um, and then you harvest it again. So basically that's like a really good way of doing carbon sequestration similar to rotational grazing with ruminants, uh, but instead you're harvesting it with your flail chopper and using the, um, the, the grass as green chop. Uh, so I know, I'm like, this is the last minute, but so we're going to try this going forward. Um, a six-year mechanized no-till, I've kind of been thinking around in my head trying to get together. So starting with sweet potatoes in year one, we do black plastic, and then we do Leaves on either side of the black plastic. Um, sweet potatoes came out pretty good. Again, we you got to keep the weeds out because you got to pull them out anyway at some point. Um, might as well be, be beforehand. Uh, and then after we harvest, we ran through the potato digger. Looks like this. This is what got me thinking. This is a really nice bed, really like fluffy and everything. Um, so it's like, why don't we just plant stuff right into there? Um, so we did no-till drill some stuff there. This one, yeah, we no-till drill later. Um, but what we ended up doing is we planted our garlic using a water wheel planter. Um, actually, so first we seeded um, oats and peas, 
And then we planted garlic in, in between those rows with our water wheel planter, because this is a really nice, good tilt in that bed. Um, and then we spread leaves over it. So this is from the end of the bed. I ran out of leaves with the spreader towards the end, but it made for good pictures so you could see what it looked like before we spread leaves on there. Um, so hopefully we're getting some mulch coverage with the oats and peas, a little extra with the, um, with the leaves. I think ideally what I would have done is spread the comp I spread compost after planting the cover crop. Um, I should have spread compost and then planted the cover crop and then planted the garlic. Um, but anyway, so we got our garlic in without having to till it again. Um, this is what the other section that we got the oats and peas in on time looks like. So half of the section is going to be gut that we planted the garlic. These two beds, we're going to try to uh, water wheel plant onions in in the spring without tilling it again. Um, it has some coverage, but we'll probably have to supplement the mulch a little bit. Um, so then the next year, this is what oh, hopefully our onions look like, but this is actually, you know, this is this year um, in a conventional tillage, but so the idea is the next year will be onions and garlic like this. And then you pull up the onions and garlic and harvest them, and you have basically a field that's been tarped or um, been under mulch for a whole period of time, then no weeds. Go through, um, plant your, uh, at this point you can either plant cover crop that you want to roll the following year for winter squash, um, or you can plant um, at this point also, uh, you know, imagine this is going to look more like this, right? But you've harvested onions off of it, but it still has some mulch on it. Um, and then you can plant your uh, brassicas, oh, is it too far back, like this, and just put your brassicas right in after that, and again, without having to till. So we're going to try doing that. Um, you know, I can let you know in a couple of years if it works. Uh, but so if we were going to do winter squash, though, um, you know, this section we're going to try to do winter squash next year. So we just no-till drilled in, roller crimper stuff, um, looks like this now. Uh, and then next year we're going to roller crimp it and plant winter squash, hopefully, see how it works. Um, just more stuff with the no-till drill. This was clover, and we no-till drilled in the clover. Or, uh, uh, we no-till drilled in oats and peas because this is going to be some onions for next year. Um, winter killed really, really well. We got nice coverage on the ground, um, and hopefully that's going to be something early, we can till early next year for an early crop. Um, mechanized no-till economics. A lot of money for the equipment, but the acre grants are out there. Um, maybe $40,000 an acre. That's nothing to shake a stick at either. Um, and it's really just, you know, I did three acres or four acres with just myself and 30 or 40 hours a week. Um, so it's definitely grow a lot more vegetables with a smaller amount of equipment. You know, you gotta make sure you have good tilth, um, high quality compost. How are you gonna transplant? That's something you worry about. Weed control is crucial. All right, we're getting to the end. I'm sorry. Thanks for staying a little bit late. Um, resources. So NOFA, we're doing a CIG no-till grant that we're part of, and some other farms studying different no-till techniques and how its effects on soil and soil fertility and soil health. Um, so. Encourage you to check this out. We're doing a soil health field days at our farm this summer, October or this fall, October fourth at Freedom Food Farm. Um, there's some other ones on the website there too. If you want to look it up, we're trying to get John Paul Cortez to come down, and we tried to get Jan Hendrick crop, but I don't think we um, have that much reach. Uh, so John Paul is great though too, and I believe also um, I forget her name, but the woman who's doing the uh, the garlic um, trials with the living mulch and. It's doing the workshop next door, I think. Um, MDAR for your acre grant. Uh, NRCS also has a CIG grant. Talk to Skip. You did that, right? Um, we got some no-till equipment for that, so that's something we might try. Yeah, Jan Hunter Crop again. John Balcortens, Rodell. No-tillveggies.org. Yeah, great resource. Go figure. Um, Brith Farm, Getting Ground, Jan Fortier, Brian O'Hare, many more people doing that. Uh, here's your resources for equipment. Brookdale, it's all in the handout, too, or email me. Uh, conclusions. So, no-till and regenerative farming is the bee's knees. It literally has the potential to save the world. Um, but it's our job to get out there and educate and organize and spread the word and develop and innovate, too, and, and let people know about it. Um, so, the education director is uh, Caro, and I, she's the one to talk to if you want to learn how to get the word out. Uh, and then, of course, in your spare time, that's a joke, uh, get involved politically, advocate for regenerative farming, Call your representatives, volunteer for campaigns, run for office. Uh, grassroots efforts is how we will save the grasses roots habitat. It's the best pun I could come up with. Um, so Marty uh, Degoberto is the NOFA Mass Policy Director. That guy knows all the
the deal with all the legislation with healthy soils and stuff. Talk to him if you want to know who, what to call your reps about, when to go down and uh, support bills at the state house. Um, talk to your reps about increasing the funding for the acre grants. Talk to your U.S. reps about the CIG grants and getting more funding for it. Too much to list here. And boom. Uh, the other thing we could do to help save the planet, in my opinion, is to uh, help this guy get elected, but I'm not going to push it too. We won't push it beyond that, but if anyone else has a conversation with me about how they can volunteer for Bernie or um, wants to talk about uh, on the fence, wants to know about it, please come talk to me, call me, email me, whatever.